History has it that the first seafarers to land on Madagascar between 1,500 and 2,000 years ago had sailed from the shores of Indonesia or East Africa. They set foot on this bountiful island whose flora and fauna were like no other. Some call it the continent island because of its size. Others call it the great red island owing to the color of its soil. It is also the island of diversity, a naturalist's paradise, the island of 18 ethnic groups. In other words, Madagascar can offer everyone a very different face. As the plane begins its descent to Antananarivo, passengers discover a country where each valley floor is home to lush rice fields. The cultivated land ends where the capital's outer suburbs begin. In the heart of Antananarivo, Sarashot's bird sanctuary is the perfect spot to observe Madagascar's avifauna. That's a duck. It isn't the season. No, they usually leave. They're the only ones that will stay. The one or two percent that will nest here. Most have left to nest elsewhere. Is that a common wax bill? Yes. Sonia Ranarivel came to Madagascar when she was nine years old. She's been surrounded by nature since a very tender age. In 1988, she and her husband set up an ecotourism travel agency. In one week, you can see three distinct regions. Enjoy different climates, go to the coast. The west coast, the east coast and the plateau are all different. I love the fact that I can experience such diversity every day. Heading north from the capital, you cross the high plateaus. This is the main island's granary. To begin with, most of Madagascar was covered in forests. 85% of this ecosystem has disappeared. The main culprits are bushfires, slash and burn agriculture, and the use of charcoal for cooking. Just two hours from Antananarivo lies one of the last vestiges of the primary forest, the Anzuzurube Corridor. It's a haven for nature lovers. Mananari Lodge is a balcony overlooking the forest. Sonia's latest creation, this camp opened in 2007, far from the roads and the noise. Local guides recruited in the surrounding villages regularly accompany scientists or nature-loving tourists. This is a Kaluma brevicornis, or short-horned chameleon. It's a female. She's about to lay her eggs. She is digging a hole in which she will deposit and bury her eggs. Chameleons could well be the symbol of Madagascar's endemism. Over 60 of the 18 known species in the world are to be found on the main island. Visitors to Madagascar are interested in the environment, not luxury hotels, competitive prices or shopping. They come for our biodiversity, and because they are aware that this biodiversity is under acute threat. Sadly, there is a lot of talk about the destruction of Madagascar. It is not acceptable for tourists to judge the Malagasy and say that it is they who are destroying the island. We finally understood the Malagasy have to feel concerned about protecting the lemurs. If they don't have food to eat or wood for heating, if they don't understand the long-term impacts, you can't stop them. You can't fence off the forest. 
This is why we've moved beyond the notion of eco-tourism. Now we're talking about sustainable tourism. It's a broader concept, and it better encompasses the problems of our tourist product in Madagascar. The east coast of Madagascar is bathed by the waters of the Indian Ocean. The Pangalan, a very humid lagoon zone, stretches 600 kilometers along the coast. It's a kind of green, Malagasy version of Venice. The Pangalan Canal forms a network of man-made and natural channels connecting a series of freshwater lakes. The rough waters of the Indian Ocean make navigation impossible. Begun by the French in 1940, the channel was supposed to provide a navigable passage between Tamatave and the far southwest of the island. Since then, it has partly silted up. The inhabitants of the coastal strip live mainly from fishing. When the force of the ocean allows, the Betsy Misarak fishermen brave the rollers in their tiny dugouts. They wait patiently for a break to dodge in and out of the waves. By the canal, life is far more peaceful. The water's mirror-like surface is barely broken by the dugout's wake. It's a long, quiet canal. The canal and the lakes are full of fish. Local women use nets to catch small, protein-rich alevins, which, once dried, will go into sauces. Small gardens provide cassava and the leaves of the bread plant. Malagasy cuisine uses a lot of these leaves. Crushed or boiled in water, they accompany most dishes. Close to the village, the Palmarium, a private reserve, not only boasts an outstanding botanical collection, but also a dozen species of lemur that roam free on its 50 hectares. <laughs> Mr. Romeo, the ranger, is a skilled imitator, and he attracts the lemurs by perfectly mimicking their calls.